Um, okay, so I'm not going to spend much time introducing people, but I thought I'd just look up one anecdotal thing from people's LinkedIn profiles. So, <laughs> so we all know Ginny already. Um, and Ginny uh, started life as a researcher at St. Jude's Children Research Hospital. I was there at some point, yeah. So at some point, yeah. That's, yeah. The, that's the most furthest back his experience in, um, in our uh, LinkedIn profile. So yes, it is. Great, thanks. Okay, so is it actually a bit of a segue from the last, um, last set of talks. Is it what I'm going to say here, actually, I made a pitch for in the conversation earlier this year, which was why, what was missing in the um, $1.9 billion dollar infrastructure thing. But anyway, so I'm going to, uh, what I want to talk to you about is make a pitch for, we need a national coherent approach to open scholarship. Um, um, in case you've missed it, as I said earlier, this is Open Access Week, and the, the theme for Open Access Week is actually designing the equitable foundations for open knowledge, which sounds like a really clunky kind of title, but actually it has a serious part underneath it, which is that we've got to do better at designing something rather than just hoping, throwing everything up in there and hoping it will come back down and uh, sort of fit nicely together. Uh, so the group that I'm talking on behalf of is the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group, which our logo is up there. Um, we have a little Kiwi, we have a Kiwi equivalent, but this is the koala one because I'm in Australia, and uh, the Open Access uh, symbol I hope you're all incredibly familiar with. Um, so, uh, why is this really important? So, um, let's just frame it in, in what we're trying to do. Equity actually is the real underpinnings behind uh, open access, certainly for, for me and for many people who work in this area. But it's a, it's a, there's, a, there's a number of different parts to it. So, first of all, um, it's equity of access, absolutely, to the published resource and educational resources, all the things we've heard about this morning. But it's also equity to publish, so you don't want to, you have to not exclude people by you develop a model that everybody has access and you exclude a whole range of people from it, that becomes problematic. And to contribute to knowledge in a different way, if it's not, may not be traditional academic publishing, um, regardless of where and who you are. And outside of Australia in the developed world, it's a massive problem, you know, we're, we're re really rapidly turning a system into equity of access, into uh, barriers to participate. So what does the kind of the ecosystem look like and why do we need to think about this? So this is a snapshot of the um, ec ecosystem and if I was being really nasty I'd cover this over and then ask you to sort of remind, come up with some of the names that are on here. Um, if everybody can, knows every acronym in this, come and talk to me afterwards. It's a massively complex um, issue. There's a few that we're familiar with, so APO's down there. There's uh, Open Library of Humanities, which again, folk might be familiar with, and Knowledge Unlatch, which is an um, Australian-born um, initiative for the humanities. So that's just what the kind of the publishing side of it looks like. And then you layer things on top, which are um, the infrastructure, so they're deliberately hard to read here, but there's things like the Open Data Institute, there's the repositories networks, there's things such as Creative Commons, which is the licensing. You know, this is, this is not a trivially um, uh, uh, th thing to negotiate. And then when you put on top of it, actually, what's actually driving all of this, there are two things. So this delightful image on the bottom right, the two 2018 um, impact factor here, actually comes from Caravate Analytics. That, those are the people that derive the impact factor. And you know, I, uh, it's, you, you, you know, there are many, many problems with it. It's an insane system, which is are basically considered to be, um, you know, the way that many academics get their credit. So what I think is we need a structured national approach. So I'd like to impose some calm on it. And how about we actually think about what policies we want first off? Why, don't we ha why do we not have a national policy on, on open access? The government accepted the productivity's recommendation in 2016 for a national policy. They accepted it in 2017 and they've done nothing about it. We have ARC and NHMRC ones, which are... Um, there, but they're not enforced. We know that 50% of the research literature in Australia is still not made openly available. There's all these principles that we, we could then structure underneath that. So open access, principles around making data available, both public data and data uh, generated by institutions. DORA is the, we could ha uh, think about uh, uh, coming up with better ways of incentivising um, academics to publish um, in a way that doesn't just driven by impact factors. And then what about the core infrastructure? And this is one of my absolute passions, is that we have no funding for core infrastructure. Our, our, the paper that I wrote for the conversation points up the issue about um, one of the fundamental principles for the web, the HTTPS protocol, for a long time was supported by, you know, one guy in his, in his attic was basically holding up most of the, 
the world's um, uh, security of the internet. Why do we not have long-term secure funding? It's absolutely insane. And then underneath that, we could put a diversity of models. And we don't have to have one for every sector, but we absolutely want to support an infrastructure. So this is the thing that I would like to see Australia doing, but I'd like us to actually design it rather than expecting it all to happen by accident. That's my thing. Thank you. Um, next up is Thomas Chappé from Wiki Journal of Science, and I looked up your LinkedIn profile. Yeah. You're a biochemist. Correct. Great. Welcome. Let me bring up your presentation. Thanks. Okay. Um, so yeah, my, my day job is as a, an evolutionary biochemist at La Trobe University, but. Um, uh, I'm here in my capacity as a journal editor today, so I'm going to be talking about um, how Wikipedia integrated academic journals can be used to disseminate knowledge. And the background to this was that maybe in the best case scenario, five people read my PhD thesis, and even a, a, a pretty decent um, academic paper uh, gets read by maybe hundreds or, or in the best case, uh, thousands of people. And this is dwarfed by even a, a median uh, Wikipedia article, and of course the um, uh, the most accessed Wikipedia articles are absolutely hugely above this, and this is because they've got a much wider audience, right? So it's the general public, but it's also uh, practicing clinicians, it's also judges, it's journalists, it's uh, research scientists. So it's got a very wide audience of people who are reading these articles and uh, often using them to inform their decision making. Um, and although the, the overall accuracy um, of Wikipedia as a whole um, is rated as reasonably high, so it was comparable to uh, the accuracy of Encyclopedia Britannica even back in 2005, and has improved considerably since then. Um, the main uh, issues that have been identified with it are um, inconsistency of coverage, so there are many topics that are uh, fundamentally missing from the encyclopedia or are undercovered. Um, uh, errors of omission or out-of-date information are far more common than um, fully incorrect or, um, uh, or malicious information. Um, often it's missing illustration, even for, uh, for topics um, where illustration is key. So for example, um, articles about uh, public sculptures, uh, many of them remain um, unillustrated. Um, and readability is, is consistently rated as extremely um, poor. So uh, overall, it is more difficult to read than a typical, um, uh, a typical uh, academic article or textbook. Um, and yet, one of the things that's always surprised me is very few academics, scholars, researchers, other experts, um, actually contribute to the encyclopedia despite its massive impact. Um, and there's a few reasons for that, um, but part of it is because um, uh, within the academic sphere, we're very used to a particular uh, way of thinking. So when we're talking about academic journals, uh, we think about highly specialized audiences, um, in a very small uh, readership, often for only a brief period of time. Most academic articles are only read during their first year or two after publication, and after that they're often never read again. Um, uh, we're used to this uh, idea of pre-publication, um, uh, secretive um, peer review by sub uh, subject specialists, which often uh, underpins the, um, the authority of those journals. Um, and, and that's why these journals have uh, a varied, but in general quite high reputation. Um, Wikipedia is uh, in some ways the opposite of this, but in some ways it has similar features, um, particularly in terms of uh, the peer review process. There's no formalized academic peer review in, in Wikipedia. It's all post-publication. Uh, it does have um, uh, peer review within the encyclopedia by other uh, generalists, but they're not um, subject specialists in the way that a journal would have. And so what are possible ways to try and merge these two systems? Well, uh, the way that I've been involved with is um, trying to use uh, Wikipedia integrated academic publishing. So this is primarily using an academic journal model, uh, but also making sure that that information is well represented on Wikipedia where people will actually read it. So the first way of doing this is articles are, uh, review articles particularly are published first in the academic journal. So this is the way that PLOS computational biology and PLOS genetics and soon PLOS one do it. Um, where an article is published in the journal and then it is copied over to become a new Wikipedia page on that topic. So I don't know, an example would be um, transcriptomics uh, was written first for PLOS computational biology and then was used to create the Wikipedia page on that topic. The opposite way around of doing this is the Wikipedia page is written first, often by a very large number of authors, and then a smaller number of those authors 
are, uh, take responsibility for putting it through a traditional um, expert peer review process. So they submit it to a journal, it's put through peer review, and then any recommendations by those peer reviewers are reintegrated back into the Wikipedia article. Uh, and a final option that uh, has been done by journals such as Gene and RNA Biology is that when an article is published on, say, a new gene family, um, the authors are also required to uh, write a Wikipedia article for that topic, and they uh, are published separately. So the content is specialized towards either a, a specialist audience or a generalist audience. And so the way um, uh, the wiki journals um, do this is, firstly, we have a public preprint server where articles are uploaded and then go through um, peer review. The peer reviewer comments are also kept public, so um, uh, the process is fully auditable. Um, articles that are uh, finally accepted for publication go through the normal process of being, for example, DOI indexed and have a stable PDF and HTML version produced for them, so it acts as a stable and citable version of record. But also it's then integrated into Wikipedia where that uh, copy of the article is then editable and updatable by anyone as uh, new information comes out. Um, as I mentioned, the wiki journals also allow people to use existing Wikipedia articles to start off um, as a preprint. And so what you end up with is a, uh, an article um, in a journal, so this is Sexual Permutation in Proteins in PLOS Comp Bile. And it's essentially the exact same information was placed into the Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia article on the same topic in 2012. And that's evolved since 2012. So down in the references section, there's a note saying that the 2012 version of this went through peer, uh, peer review. If you want to see that version, you can see here. But this is going to be, have been considerably updated since then because a lot of papers have come out on that topic. Um, uh, and so uh, if people are interested in getting further involved in this, there are three um, journals currently in the WikiJournal publishing group. Uh, the original one, WikiJournal of Medicine, has been running since 2014, but there's also a more general WikiJournal of Science and WikiJournal of Humanities, which also covers uh, social sciences and the arts. Um, we're always looking for uh, associate editors to help us out with the um, peer review organization uh, pro uh, process. But um, additionally, uh, authors, either authorship by people in this room or encouraging people within your institutions to consider whether uh, topics of knowledge within your institutions are properly covered on Wikipedia, I encourage you to get in touch uh, for possible um, submission of publications. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have uh, Brendan Fitzgerald, who uh, is going to come back again this afternoon. Um, so Brendan is with 641DI. Yes. And uh, in your LinkedIn profile, you were library manager at the Bayside City Council. I was. <laughs> I'll just uh, go to the fetal position right now. <laughs> no, I... It's actually a bit there for a long time and... Um, just interesting on Wikipedia. We had a we had a uh, we had a um, Wikipedia entry on Vicnet, and uh, Derek and I discovered a few years ago that an academic in the UK had pulled it down because he didn't think it was uh, of relevance. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm just going to talk very very quickly about some of the more recent some of the more recent um, engagements, uh, particularly the. Um, I suppose the community work I've been doing uh, with Info Exchange more recently uh, and um, through two bodies called the Australian Digital Inclusion Alliance, which we, we were party to setting up a couple of years ago, and the Broadband for the Bush Alliance, which I'm actually a board member of and we've been in operation for about um, uh, seven or eight years now. As effectively, they both um, are, are organisations that advocate for digital inclusion, and so that's their kind of key, their key role. One of, the, um, one of the things I want to talk about today particularly is the, me the, um, the mechanism they use for gathering collective voice across disparate organisations as a party to those, those bodies. So the Australian Digital Inclusion Alliance, for example, includes Google, um, Telstra, Australia Post, it has Red Cross, it's got Info Exchange and Community Sector, and it has government involved. So you can see there's a whole range of kind of disparate, different interests, um, different approaches, um, different organisations. So how do we actually gather them together in, uh, in developing um, a collective voice approach for you know, things like responses to, to government inquiries? Um, a couple of examples of where we've done that more recently 
in, uh, at our Darwin Forum for the Broadband for the Bush Alliance, we use the World Cafe technique to, to um, use that as the base for our response to the regional uh, telecommunications review, which is just uh, currently underway. It's the third one, by the way, in about four or five years. So four or five years. So there's a lot of really good work out there. Clearly, if they're having three three reviews in four or five years. Um, the other 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 example where we've used this is the broadband for the Bush Alliance have been advocating very strongly over the last few years for uh, digital inclusion to be included in in the uh, closing the gap uh, measures. Um, for indigenous, uh, indigenous KPIs, indigenous metrics for closing the gap. And we have had some success in that, but certainly most governments around the country have acknowledged that that's an issue. So as you can imagine, gathering a whole range of bodies together that are very different um, and have different approaches, uh, it's, a, it's quite a challenge. So what are some of the, what are some of the, um, what are some of the kind of uh, imperatives and, and, uh, and considerations we need to take into, account, into, into account? Um, so things like, um, you know, some of the key elements. So things like respect for the fact that, so, that some organisations, in fact, most organisations are very different in the way they're structured. So organisations like, um, you know, uh, Info Exchange has a board and it's, it's a fact that's quite, quite flexible and able to, to respond. But when you go to organisations like Google, or Australia Post, as commercial operations, they pretty much won't put their logo to, well, they won't put their logos to anything. Uh, that might be an advocacy piece. So how do you involve them in a way that, uh, that can get the best out of those organisations? Um, so you need to respect those internal, those internal processes that those organisations actually have. So Red Cross, for example, is international. So the time frames to get through uh, a response to a, a telecommunication review, for example, um, takes, takes longer than their actual their internal processes can, can meet. It's also one of the really important things, and I won't go into any great detail, one of the really important things is actually okay for organisations to, to not agree with the position you might take. So one of the pieces that Australian Digital Inclusion Alliance has been working on uh, is very much focused on advocating for um, a better affordability. And of course with Telstra in the room, um, they're not going to put their logo or name to some of the things that we might actually say as a collective group. Although they do actually help us in better understanding some of that, that work. And uh, So that's just one example. Just some of the key challenges very, very quickly. Um, as you can imagine, uh, and hearing Karen talk earlier today, the, the resource uh, base is very, very weak. Um, so, and also, one of the key indicators there is that no one really wants to fund key things like the administrative back end of alliances. Um, they want to fund the sexy things like, you know, can we do something really good with the website or whatever it might be, but no one wants to fund you know, how you actually keep the wheels running and keep it going. That's actually quite a big challenge. Um, and that's a challenge to continuity. Um, the other key thing is that uh, broad and open access to information is vital, and uh, thank you. And uh, and the need to keep things actually cheap, easy, and useful, uh, which is again is another saying from our, back in our Vicnet days, um, is really important. So um, accessible, usable, um, and and readily available. So one of the things we're going to do later on today is um, is we're going to actually, in fact, I, I think Ginny may have already done it. Is, um, is use the World Cafe uh, uh, model to start doing some work around um, how we can make change happen and how we can actually design a bit of a roadmap for what that, that knowledge, public knowledge agenda looks like. So in effect, um, that's this afternoon's work. So I thought I'd use today to set that up and to just give you a bit of background on how that kind of works. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, our very own Craig Bird from APO. Craig's also working with Swinburne Centre for Urban Transitions, and you don't have a LinkedIn profile. I do. You don't? Oh, I couldn't find it. Sorry. Yeah. No, but I know that uh, in Craig's early life, he was a software engineer, so uh, we're very lucky to have him at APO. Um, let me get another presentation. Five minutes. All right. Hi, folks. Um, this is just a bit of fun before lunch, really. Um, <laughs> My background's in computing and um, I came to APO and I wondered if there could be a way to do um, kind of Plumex style citations and all that fancy stuff, but for the uh, lowly grey literature. And um, the big question of course is, are people reading my stuff? And Plumex will certainly tell you if people are reading your journal articles, whereas what um, Amanda called our organisational resources, uh, we, we basically just get views and this is how we do it at the moment. At, um, APO, 168 people uh, checked out my document, and yes, there are ways to see uh, in unique visitors and things like that, and did they come from China? Um, but really, 
we want to know more than that. So I would actually like to know what parts of my work are getting used. Um, what I'm putting in front of you here is just an idea. Um, it may have been done before and it might be rubbish, but I'm um, going to forge on anyway. Um, at the moment, authors use bibliographic citations and perhaps they say page 23. Okay? This is a, a system that we're building. It's one of these bespoke sites that APO is starting to make around specific collections. Um, and in this case, uh, what is going to come up is a reader. So um, I'm going to pretend in this example that energy in buildings is no longer belongs to Elsevier and it's actually now a free and open uh, journal. <laughs> and so it'll come up on APO and what you're seeing here is uh, the usual stuff. Um, but what, sh what, what you can see here is I've highlighted a line and there's a pop-up menu that offers to cite it. I don't know if you can see that but it says cite here. So I can select something and I can actually cite it. And what happens is that I um, get a citation, and you're all, I'm sure, more than familiar with this thing, and it gets a URL at the bottom. And the URL might just say, oh, it's, it's just this resource, go to the APO and get it. But I'd like to go further, and I'd like to capture the identity of the person who put it up there, who put the resource up there, and I'd like to capture the bounding box of text that I selected, and that's a unique bibliographic entry that goes in my report. So here's my report. Here's my references, and somewhere in the many references is this URL. So what, what's really going on here? Um, this is a tracker, okay? I've created a bibliographic entry with a nasty tracker in it. So let's use evil trackers to do good. <laughs> and the outcome is, here's the, here's the article that I wrote, and um, there it is, I can see it. But what comes with it is a kind of a health check. Um, if you can just see that, I'll actually read it out, it's pretty small, but it, it says the number of views of my article on APO is 128, but it actually shows a bit more than that. I've had 128 views, my article is now in 14 bibliographies out there on the interweb, and people have visited those third party resources and clicked them 123 times. So what I hope this looks like is a kind of closing of the loop. We, we put the evidence up on APO, people come and they find it, and they cite it, and they embed it in reports and plans and whatnot, and so we know that the evidence is being used. Where else can we go with this? This is the kind of report that we might put together. Um, it's a bit, a bit dense, but what it shows you is uh, users who've come to APO, whether they logged in or not, as Bobby Brown, or whether they like to be anonymous, like Lonely Girl 15, and they came to us and they cited our stuff and they made reports and these are the reports that they made okay these are the urls of the reports that they made and embedded citations to apo resources in this case we just don't know where this one went okay it's some offline pdf we're never going to know and we also know what they took so they just took a link to the whole article like they do now these people here took a link to a frame and this is what I can see. I can see that they came in, they read this, they highlighted this, this is what they're citing in their bibliography. This particular thing. And that particular thing might be the controversial thing. In my report, I thought actually no one would pay attention to. Um, that's it. Thank you. Wow. Definitely use that. Thank you very, very much, Craig, for sharing that with us, and stay tuned. <laughs> um, right, thank you, Craig. And last but not least, uh, Professor Pompeo Casanovas Romeo from La Trobe Law School. Uh, I think looked up your LinkedIn profile as well, and uh, you were educated in Spanish and French in your yeah. LinkedIn profile, and um, uh, have an education in philosophy and, and law, of course. Thank you very much for coming today, and thank you very much for coming to give a five-minute lightning presentation. Can you just bring it up? Please. first one is linked democracy, and the second one is method of law. And I'm doing this because actually 
if you are going to do a tracker, you would be a criminal in Europe. <laughs> and you know that. After the GDPR. So the problem is that law is not adapted to what we are doing. This is the problem. And uh, political theory is not adapted either. So in this sense, our objective is expanding and embedding into the structure of the web of data and services the protections and guarantees of the rule of law, but in a particular safe way. It's not that easy, but it's feasible. I, I stole from you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew that you were there, so I borrowed from you because I thought that this was very clear. This is the process of publishing in open access. If you follow the steps, you will see that you start with DOIs, but starting with DOIs means starting with language. So we have a problem with language. When we are uh, doing objects on the web, everybody is publishing, everybody. So this is something like the semantic web. Everybody is uploading uh, things and uh, being a prosumer, so a consumer and producer at the same time. So my idea would be, and would like to convey it, that in order to make this happen, we need to change the language of the law and the political science. This is what we are doing. I will skip this, but just, OK. If you go through it, immediately you arrive to the technology. It's the only way. Sometimes we forget it. We forget about it because we are using natural language. And this is a problem for us. So the web of data for us is any data available at the web, on the web, in any form. And linked data is a subset of the former set. So an approach to publishing and sharing data on the web. This is the precise meaning that uh, I am using here. OK. The reconstruction of the public domain for us is the reconstruction of a public space. If we are using public domain, uh, that's, that's difficult because we are using as well private domain. And this is a, a legal term. I would prefer to say that I am constructing or reconstructing the language for the law and for political science using a public space. We are constructing a public space, not a public domain or a private domain, which is much more restricted. OK, this is lean democracy. What Marta Poblet, because we are presenting, I forgot about it, sorry about that. This is three presenters in one. <laughs> so that's me, Marta Poblet, and uh, Victor Rodriguez Doncel. Victor is a computer scientist. Marta is a political scientist. I am something else. I don't know exactly what, <laughs> but I am something else. And Marta is talking about the meso level, which means that in between people decisions and political decisions, we have always some kind of device. And this device has to be organized because this means uh, information and knowledge. So we have to organize knowledge in order to reproduce the whole cycle. And there we have the problem. The problem is that if we are going to regulate it, even co-regulation, self-regulation, heteroregulation, normative multi-agent systems, whatever, we have the law that it's written in two dimensions, the social dimension and the legal dimension. This is two things, only two dimensions, natural language. Natural language in order to do this particular social dimension. But what we have now is different. We have algorithms. We have technical languages. We have semi-technical languages. We have different kinds of logics. We are inventing something that is going beyond the standard deontic logic, non-standard deontic logic, in order to be applied and to regulate rights and duties on the web. So we have a problem because we have several dimensions there, at least three. And in this sense, we have to reconstruct what we are able to do through informational means. Not only this, if we are going to produce what you call an ecosystem, you need several stakeholders, you need several languages, you need several authorities, and you need to coordinate these actions. How are we going to coordinate this? Because by now, this is a mess. And go to the courts and you will see. Why? Because we are using this natural language that we have, and that's good. This is the only tool we have. But we have to produce and refine this tool through 
the languages that we are able to produce now. In this sense, the meta rule of law is the linguistic dimension of the rule of law plotted, applied to languages, to the languages that we are using in order to construct the knowledge and the informational uh, communication that we are doing on the web. In this sense, two concepts, meta rule of law and lean democracy. Meta rule of law, protections and principles of the rule of law can be represented into the languages of the web of data and embedded into compliance systems. This is another different topic, but, but I have a problem. Uh, yes, I have a problem. I have a project on compliance. <laughs> compliance <laughs> systems to generate trust and to define the global space as a public space <laughs> and link democracy. In absence of a rule of law with international scope, the notion of link democracy operates within this space in which corporations, companies, rulers, providers, consumers, and citizens are using all kinds of linked data repositories that cannot be treated as separate silos, as they are linked through graph-driven mechanisms. And this is what we are doing now in Europe. We have a project to relate all the laws, which is called links. This is part, partly, part of the links project as well, and two more projects. And thank you very much. This is... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So you've just seen very quickly a lot of great ideas and, and challenges.